One thing I had always dreamt of becoming was a big, famous person who got her money by doing whatever on the internet. Day after day, I would dream of what I could do to make people know me, to make people put my name on their mouth every day, to have more than 10 likes and 5 comments on a post. My boyfriend Chris always said being an internet sensation would bring up nothing but your life being public. I didn't listen. It was being internet famous or nothing else. I neglected school because of the internet. Exams were approaching. One of the most important exams to write as a physiotherapy student, but the internet had slowly become my school. I preferred to be on it than listen to any teachers. When I realized what I could do that would make people know me, I wasted no time in starting it. I created both an Instagram page and a YouTube channel that had to do with pranks. People would watch me prank other people. They would try it on others, and from there, more people would watch my videos. It seemed like the best idea. Pranking others just means you're playing on their trust. You can't just say it's for fun. You don't know if the person you pranked sees it as fun or not, he said. Don't get so serious about it. Like I said the other day, it's all for fun and it's what my followers want to see, and I have to give it to them. Don't say I didn't warn you when it all goes wrong, he said. I ignored him and pranked my parents, my siblings, friends, even strangers. Everything was going great. The number of likes increased to about 2,000 on every one of my posts, and I had about 1,000 comments on each post. What I wanted finally happened, and I couldn't be happier. Chris was the next victim of my prank. My followers dared me to prank my boyfriend to know how he would handle if I had cheated on him with one of his friends. I was very scared to do it, but I was also curious to know how well he trusted me. I waited till he was out of the house to set up the cameras, putting about three cameras in the bedroom at different angles. I decided to make it a live video. If I was going to cry, I would want the whole world to see that I was at least not the bad person here. After about 30 minutes, Chris showed up. I sat down quietly on the bed, faking a sad and remorseful face and almost held tears in it. When he walked in, he noticed me seated quietly at the corner, holding the sheets to myself with my legs raised up and placed together. Rose? He called quietly, holding me closer to himself as he sat on the bed. I turned to look at him. He asked why I hadn't spoken to him since he got back and why I looked so sad. With a straight face, I told him I was sorry. I'm confused. Sorry about what? I know I shouldn't have done it, but I don't know. It just happened. He asked if I killed someone, and I shook my head in the negative. Did you hit any lecturer in the class? He asked, smiling. What kind of questions are these? I couldn't laugh out loud. Did he trust me that much not to cheat on him or hurt him? He had not even asked that. I hurt you, I said, hoping he would at least understand what I was driving at. Hurt me? How? He asked. I told him I cheated on him and immediately moved away from him as far as possible to be sure I was safe from whatever his reaction would be. He was quiet for a while, his head down and his eyes closed. Okay, was all he said. When I asked him what he meant, he just looked at me calmly. How was he still calm? I was going crazy in my head. I begged him to say something. There's no point in yelling and faking being hurt when I did the same thing. Since we are confessing today, you should know. I also cheated on you, he said. No emotions or anything. His face was blank and void of any expression. I stared at him in shock for a few seconds before I slapped him. How could you? I shouted. He then pushed me hard and I fell down on the bed. Don't try to play the victim card here. You know you too have been a horny mean bitch. His eyes were cold and his words left me speechless. I ran to the door and blocked his way. You asshole! I never cheated on you. It was all a prank, I said. My eyes felt heavy from tears. He wanted to end our relationship? Chris slapped me across the face and I screamed. 
I opened my mouth to ask him why he hit me, and then he slapped me again. I was screaming for him to stop, but he didn't seem to hear me. Shut up! I can't even stand the sight of you! When I remembered that I was recording what was happening, my tears came harder. Everyone could see Chris beating me up. My body hurt in many places, and I started to feel lightheaded. Chris! I whispered. Shut up! He yelled, slamming my head on the floor. When I woke up, I was in the back of an ambulance van. The only thing I could think about was how I could never face anyone after what they just witnessed. They saw me being beat up. That was one of the worst disgraces that could happen to an internet icon. I later got to know that it was one of my followers that alerted the police, but by the time they got to my place, Chris was gone. My prank really went wrong, and I learnt my lesson the hard way. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> the door to my apartment caught on something and I had to forcefully push my way in. It caught on the end of the rug. My new apartment was small, but I liked it. I didn't have to worry about cleaning since there wasn't much room. It had just one room and bathroom, which made sense since I was the only one living there. I was trying to find my own path after college. My dream was to be a successful movie star. I had done a couple of movies, but I was usually given minor roles. I believed I would find the perfect casting that would put me out there. I finished setting things up in my apartment and went on Craigslist to get myself a laptop before I spent my money on something else. I picked one that had all the specifications I wanted and wasn't too costly. The seller and I agreed to meet at the bus stop not far from my apartment. Are you Phoebe, the girl who's buying a laptop? I looked at the girl that was talking to me. Yeah, I replied. She was dressed in black clothes and had piercings on her face. Two on her eyebrows, one on her nose, and several on her ears. To say she looked shady would be an understatement. Got the cash? I nodded and brought it out. She handed me the laptop in a case and I gave her the money. She didn't say anything else and she walked away from me. I searched for jobs online with my new laptop and applied for several of them. The high hopes I had started to come down when none of the places I applied to contacted me for even an interview. A few days had gone and still no luck. As I was surfing the web, my mailbox icon pulsed. I read the message. I need you to deliver a parcel for me. I rolled my eyes and exited the inbox. It was obviously spam. Another message dropped and I opened it. It was a video. I played it and my mouth dropped open. It was a video of me on the phone with Bailey as I worked on my laptop. The conversation just happened the day before. Chills ran down my body as I watched myself. How did this happen? The view looked like it was from my laptop camera. One way or the other, this person could record what I was doing with my laptop. I sent a reply and said I would deliver the parcel. My hands were shaking as I typed. I had never felt so violated in my life. I heard a knock on my door and went to see who was there. I opened the door and saw a package on the floor. A note was placed on it with a delivery address. I looked around but didn't see anyone that could have dropped it. I knew the package was the one I was supposed to deliver. I went back inside and placed it in my room. This person could have more incriminating videos of me. I decided to deliver the parcel. I looked up the address online and saw that it wasn't far from my place. The parcel was like a small envelope. It was sealed and I had no interest to know what was inside. When I got to the destination, I called the number on the note and told the person I was there. It was right beside the cafe at the end of the street. A guy in a hoodie came out and collected the parcel from me. I got to my apartment later and refused to put on my laptop. If the person could see me through the camera, I would not give them anything new to blackmail me with. A few days passed and I thought that would be the end of it. I was relieved, thinking it was a one-time thing. However, it was not to be. One night, a message came in from an unknown number on my phone and my heart leapt in my throat, dreading the content. I opened it to see another message asking me to deliver a package. 
I typed no in capital letters and felt proud of myself. I didn't think the person could have anything incriminating on me. Then another message came in, a video. It was a video of me topless in front of my laptop. My face grew red with anger. I had no choice but to deliver the package. I agreed to it and the parcel was dropped outside my door. The messages kept coming after that. The person would send a video first before asking me to send the parcel. I became the errand girl. In the midst of that, I was still searching for casting roles and had applied to a few. I got a call that I was going to be given a role in a movie that would show in the theaters. My excitement was dampened when I saw that I had a message to deliver yet another package that night. I sighed and went out with it. When I become rich and famous, anyone who dared to use me would pay for it. Hands up! Put your hands where I can see them! I froze, parcel still in my hand. I slowly brought up my hands and tears sprung to my eyes. The cops handcuffed me and took the parcel from my hand. The parcel contained drugs. I pleaded and told them that I was being blackmailed. There was no proof to vindicate me. The videos on my laptop looked like I recorded them myself. When the judge passed the three-month jail sentence on me, I felt numb. Just when I was starting to think I could progress in my career, I was going to jail. I sometimes still shiver when I remember those three months. The time I spent behind bars was tough. The other ladies there were bullies. They liked to pick on me because I was the new delinquent. I had to learn to fight back. That was when they started to leave me alone. In my time in prison, I plotted revenge for whoever had set me up. On the day of my release, Sally, my only friend in jail, gave me numbers of her crew that she claimed would help me if I told them we were buddies. Sally still had a few months left before she got released though. I called her friends and narrated my ordeal to them. When I told them about my plan, they were all too willing to help me out. They helped me track down the girl from Craigslist and we found out where she lived. In the night, we went to the girl's house and dug holes in her yard. We planted packets of drugs inside the holes and covered them up nicely. The next morning, I put a call to the police telling them I wanted to report a crime. Sally's friends and I stayed nearby so we could watch the drama unfold. The shock on the girl's face when the police unearthed packets of drugs from her yard was priceless. They arrested her and I was sure she would be looking at a few years in prison. I also knew that Sally would treat her really well. This is going to be your stepmom, Julia. Sasha, meet Julia, my daughter. My dad said. I looked at him surprised, then I looked at Sasha. She looked young under all the makeup, but I knew she was around 30 years old. My dad told me that he has been seeing someone for a while now, but I never knew it was serious. At 20, I knew I didn't need a mother like other kids would since I was all grown up. My dad looked happy though, smiling at Sasha like I wasn't in front of them. I extended my hand for a handshake, but Sasha pulled me in for a hug. Her perfume clouded my nostrils. We're going to be best buddies, Julia, she said, her voice sounding so high-pitched. I winced and smiled back. I told my dad I was happy for him and welcomed Julia to the family. She moved in with us barely two weeks later. They had a court wedding the week before and went on a honeymoon in Rio. My dad stayed at home for one more week, saying that he was his own boss and deserved time with his new wife. I thought Sasha liked my dad though. I didn't think she liked me. She would laugh at my dad's boring jokes and find a reason to constantly touch him. If I was with them, her smile would seem a little forced and it appeared like she was trying to show my dad she wanted to be on good terms with me. My dad trusted her a lot and was head over heels in love with her. My dad went back to work, his own company, and it made me apprehensive that it would be just me and Sasha at home. I stayed in my room, refusing to come out and force a conversation. I wasn't prepared for it. There was a knock on my door. I opened the door for her and asked her if she needed anything. Her arms were crossed and she was looking at me with distaste in her expression. 
How old are you, Julia? She asked. I was frowning when I told her that I was 20 years old, wondering where the conversation was going. Don't you think you should have moved out of your father's house by now? I stared at her for a few seconds as I replayed what she said in my head. Was she chasing me out of my own father's house? Before I could reply, she told me that she understood that I wanted to stay with my dad so I could take care of him and reduce his loneliness. She said that she was with him now and there was no need for me to remain with him. He has me as his wife now. You're no longer needed, she emphasized. Her words were hurtful, but I refused to let her see it. I smiled and told her I'd hurt her. I knew I couldn't tell my dad. He would either not believe me or worse, take her side. It was something I had to deal with on my own. We had two cars, mine and dad's. Sasha complained to my dad that she needed my car so she could move in the city without stress. My dad asked me to give her the keys, promising to get me another car soon. Sasha looked at me with a smug smile and I felt crushed within. I started to take the bus to college and it was a downgrade from how I used to go to school. I told myself that I could cope with it and put on my brave face. I've made Sasha a shareholder in the company, my dad said over dinner. I swallowed the mouthful of spaghetti and asked, What? I refused to look at Sasha because I knew she would have a triumphant look on her face. Yes, my darling. My dad reached over and squeezed Sasha's hand. She now owns 15%. 15% was a lot in my dad's company, just a little lower than my 20%. I looked at my dad's happy face and forced out a smile. I went downstairs to the laundry room to wash my clothes that I dropped there the night before. I eyed a basket of pale yellow clothes, thinking it looked like it contained my clothes. Upon going through it, I realized they were my clothes. Someone had washed my clothes without separating the colors. A yellow sweater had been washed with the whites and I knew it was deliberate. I marched upstairs to confront Sasha. She had an evil smile on her face as she told me that it was unintentional. I had to try to keep my anger in check. She was obviously lying, but I couldn't do anything about it. The next day, I found out that all my favorite cereals had been thrown out. Sasha claimed that they were all expired. We both knew they weren't, but my dad believed her completely. What broke my resolve not to get frustrated was when I discovered that I got blocked from my dad's data plan. I had an assignment to submit and I needed an internet connection desperately. I had to haul a cab back to school so I could use Wi-Fi. I got home around 8 in the evening, drained. I planned to just crash on my bed and go to sleep. When I got to my room, I had to rub my eyes because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. All my clothes were strewn on the floor, my bed, and some were hanging crookedly off the hangers. Even my underwear wasn't spared. My shoes were off the rack and were lying around. That bitch! I cursed. The following day, I searched for an apartment and told my dad I was moving out. He was sad, but I told him I was more than ready to stay on my own. The smile Sasha gave me as I left tempted me to punch it off her face, but I restrained myself. I pitied my dad because I was sure Sasha wasn't with him because she loved him. I couldn't do anything but watch from a distance because my dad was too emotionally dependent on her. I would visit my dad once in a while and preferred it when we went out just the two of us. A few months went by. We were supposed to go to Fort, a classy restaurant downtown, and I looked forward to it. When I got inside, I saw my dad sitting at one of the back tables, his head in his hands. Dad, what's wrong? I asked as I sat down. That bitch, Sasha. She left me. She took your car. Documents of one of the properties I transferred to her name. She sold off her shares at my company and ran off with the money. My dad closed his eyes, swallowing hard. I wasn't surprised, but I felt angry. Angry at Sasha. Angry at my dad for being too stupid in love to see Sasha for who she was. 
I was also angry at myself because I thought there was nothing I could have done to prevent this from happening. As I consoled my dad, I swore to myself that I would find Sasha. I would make her pay. I waited by my phone, hoping it would ring soon. I had contacted a private investigator to locate Sasha and bring me her details. I knew she couldn't have left without leaving any traces, even though it seemed that way. I sighed, thinking about my father. It had only been a month since she ran away with my dad's money, my car, and documents to one of his prime real estate. And now, he had slipped into a deep depression. He really loved Sasha. He barely went to work anymore. My phone rang and I picked it up immediately. Hello? It was my boyfriend, Nate, and he wanted to know if we were still going to hang out later in the evening. I told him I could not make it because I was still looking for Sasha. I had been seeing him less recently due to the problems Sasha caused. I had to be there for my dad. I don't get why you should be personally responsible. You've reported to the cops. Let them handle this. You're becoming so bitter, Nate said. I shook my head. He didn't understand. I could not just sit around and hope that someday the cops would find Sasha without doing anything. I told him that once I found her, everything would be over. He hung up on me in annoyance. I was frowning at my phone when another call came in. This time, it was the private investigator. You better have something good to tell me, I said, not bothering with pleasantries. It had been two weeks now, and he had not given me anything worthwhile. I was paying him a lot of money to get zero results. He told me he had found Sasha. Apparently, she was staying in a hotel in Rio, where she and my dad went for their honeymoon. She was being careful not to buy anything with her name, so it could not be traced back to her. I told him to send me the details of the hotel and her room number and he promised to do so immediately. I smiled and thanked him before I hung up. I packed my things and booked a flight for Rio. Sasha would never know what was coming for her. I called Nate to tell him the good news. We had been dating for almost a year now and we told each other everything. I smiled, sure that he was going to be happy for me when I told him I found Sasha. Had a change of heart? He asked. I told him everything the police investigator told me in full details. That's great. Have you told the cops? I sighed and explained to him that I was going to Rio to apprehend Sasha myself. Nate sounded disappointed in me and said that the incident had changed me into someone else. He said I was no longer the person he fell in love with. When I tried to tell him my plan, he didn't want to listen and told me to never call him again. My heart was broke as I ended the call and I told myself that once I was back from Rio, I would go to Nate and everything would be resolved. My flight to Rio was spent with me perfecting my plan till I was sure nothing would go wrong. I got to the hotel and went to the front desk. I have a delivery for Sasha Raymond. I showed the receptionist a phony ID and business card, and she directed me to Sasha's room. I pulled my face cap low and knocked on the door before yelling that I had a package for her. She told me to come in and I could hardly keep myself from smiling. I entered and turned around quickly to lock the door. Sasha stood up, wondering what was going on. When I turned around and she saw my face, her face paled. She shrank back and ran to dive for the telephone near her bed. I brought out a fake gun and told her to raise her hands up. She complied, trembling. Julie, wait, we can talk this through. I didn't want to listen to her ramblings, so I told her to shut up. I always knew you were a horrible person. Sasha got bold and put her hands down. And so what? Did you think I could love an old and slow man like your father and choose to stay with him? <laughs> she laughed. You can't do anything to me. They'll trace it back to you. Just go back home and cry to your daddy, you stupid girl. I got furious but managed to clamp my anger down. I smiled at her. She had no idea I was recording our entire conversation. When I confronted her about running away with my dad's money, she was so proud of herself and explained in detail how she duped my dad. 
There was a tiny video camera in front of my cap, and it captured everything Sasha was saying. Again, Julia, stop being a cunt. There's nothing you or anybody else can do about it. I frowned at her and shook my head in regret. I made sure I looked crestfallen and went out of the room. I went to give the police the video and recording after I edited it so it could not implicate me. They arrested Sasha because they now had more than enough evidence and knew her location. During the trial, my dad stood as a witness and got teary as he recounted the story. I felt pity for him as he broke down in tears when Sasha was taken away. She looked at him with so much distaste and I wanted to punch it off her face. I consoled my dad afterwards and he asked if I could move back with him. I sadly told him no. It was time for me to stay on my own. I promised him I would come over from time to time and not be far away. I had been trying to reach Nate since I got back from Rio, but he had been ignoring my calls. Today, I decided that I would go to his place immediately after the trial. I drove to his place, rehearsing all I would say on the way. If I could make him understand why I had to go after Sasha myself, he would see where I was coming from. I knocked on his door and he opened the door after a few seconds. He looked at me with a bored expression. Nate, why have you been ignoring me? He sighed and told me that it was time for us to end our relationship. He said he never realized how much of a vengeful person I was. Even when I explained to him that I did nothing to Sasha and only got evidence for the police, he was immovable in his decision. I begged him to change his mind, but he was adamant. He told me to leave and promptly closed the door in my face. I spent the night crying. Even though I got the revenge I wanted, I lost something precious to me. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> Looking for a place to live is pretty hard sometimes. There's nothing particularly enjoyable about going from place to place, being disappointed by either the owner of the apartment, the neighborhood it's in, or even the distracting neighbors who love to play their music at maximum volume at 1 a.m. Yeah, it's a hassle looking for a decent place to live. That's what I experienced, at least, when looking for my first apartment a while ago. I was about 22 years old. I had very little money, but I had high expectations for the place. I was looking on Craigslist one night, while I was still at my parents' house, and I stumbled upon this amazing one-bedroom apartment. Are you freaking kidding me? I said to myself, because I just couldn't believe my eyes. The place looked great. I didn't even care about the neighborhood or any of these aspects. I saw that the rent was pretty low and the furniture and everything looked good. I mean, it had a lot of taste. I tried to call the owner, but he didn't respond. I guess he was sleeping because it was almost 11 p.m., but I had to get in contact with him as soon as possible. The place might be gone in the morning and I didn't want to take any chances. This is where I'm going to live. I said to myself again before leaving the owner a text saying that I am interested in renting the apartment right away and I would pay cash. I was so excited that I didn't manage to get any sleep that night. I already imagined myself on the couch in the living room playing on my PS4 on that big screen smart TV that it had. The next morning, I got a text at around 7 a.m. Hey, the place is still available. If you want to check it out, I'll be here from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., the text said. I immediately replied, telling the guy that I most definitely want to come see it. For the remainder of the time, I didn't do anything except pack and tell my mom and dad about the apartment. They also liked it, saying that it looked better furnished than their house and that I should do anything to get it. It was a steal, the rent being so low. Time went by slowly. At around 3.50 p.m., I was in front of the building. It didn't look like much, but hey, I didn't care at all. I decided to look around for 10 to 15 minutes so that the owner won't think I'm that desperate in getting the apartment, even though I was. I killed a little bit more time and then I went in. 
As I walked up the stairs, towards the second floor of the building, my heart started pounding in my chest. Step by step, I got more excited, and images of me enjoying the apartment popped into my head. Finally, I arrived at the door. The apartment was number seven, being the second one on the second floor. My lucky number. I took a deep breath. Okay, this is it. I hope it's just like the pictures. I said to myself before knocking on the door. No one answered. So I knocked again. And then I did it again for a couple of seconds. No one answered. My excitement slowly started to go down. I knew this was some sort of sham. It was too good to be true. I told myself before deciding to go down the stairs and head home. But after the first step I took, my phone buzzed. It was a text message from the owner. Hey, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be a little late. I'll be there in about an hour. Thanks. It said, I didn't like that I had to wait an entire hour, but at least the guy was going to show up, and I didn't come here for nothing. The hallway was pretty big, and I had a window to look out from while I waited. Ten minutes went by, and I got sick of watching cars go by, so I took out my phone and started scrolling through Instagram. As I was watching a cute video with two cats, a powerful noise got my attention. It sounded like something heavy fell on the floor, but there wasn't anything around me, so I turned my attention to the window. Maybe something was happening on the street. As I did that, another noise startled me. But there was nothing outside, only cars driving by, no construction site or anything. After the third time I heard the noise, I figured out that it came from the apartment adjacent to the one I was going to rent. So it had to be a catch. I'll have noisy neighbors. Well, I can live with that, I said to myself before returning my gaze to my phone. After a couple of seconds, I heard someone screaming. It was like the person was yelling, actually, at someone, but I didn't hear another voice. Do what I say, the person said before the noise of broken glass made me take two steps back. What's going on in there? I said to myself. Being a curious person, I put my phone in my pocket and headed towards the door so I could hear what was going on. You stupid piece of shit, I heard. It was a woman's voice yelling. Then I could hear a second voice. Ah! It sounded like a man in pain. Then he screamed in agony. Please, stop, please! He yelled. Everything was getting pretty creepy. I mean, I could tolerate loud neighbors, but this was just something else. It seemed like someone was getting hurt in there. I decided to do something about it. So... I tried to open the door. To my surprise, it was open. It slowly creaked when I pushed it. The apartment was dark. All the lights were off. Hello? I said while walking inside, fearful of what could happen or what was going on. Stay still, I could hear. The voice came from another room. Ah, please, I beg you, stop, the other voice said. My heart pounded again, but not from excitement. I was scared of the entire situation, and I had my phone in my hand, ready to call 911. Hello? Is everything okay here? I heard the commotion, and I thought I'd check on you guys, I said. Suddenly, a door opened. It was from the bedroom, and out of it, a small woman came. I didn't clearly see her in the dark. Get out of here! I'll call the cops! You have no right to come in here! She said, before pushing me. Okay, sorry, I wanted to make sure everything's okay. I told her. Yeah, I'm fine. Now go away! She said. I turned around to go to the door, and as I approached the light in the hallway, I saw that I had bloodstains on my shirt. The woman pushed me away, and it rubbed off from her hands. I didn't say anything about that, and I gently closed the door. She locked it behind me. I immediately called the cops and reported some strange activity. They came, and as soon as they saw the blood on my shirt, they went into the apartment. 
What I saw was gruesome. The woman had a man tied to a table. The man had cuts all over his body, and blood was draining into some jars on the floor. She was taken into custody immediately, but the guy unfortunately died right there as they took him out of the apartment. It was a scene I will never forget for as long as I live. At that moment, I ran down the stairs and went home. I forgot all about the apartment and didn't want anything to do with that building ever again. I've never been close to my mom. Ever since I was a little girl, we never really got on the same page. I don't know what it was. I would normally see little girls having the time of their lives with their moms. They'd go shopping, they'd watch movies, they'd make cookies and so on. But no, I don't have any memory, even similar to that. Mom and dad got divorced when I was eight years old. I don't know what happened between them and I never asked. Nothing changed in my life really. Only the fact that I wouldn't see mom anymore. I moved in with my dad who was the best person in the entire world. He would always do anything in his power so that I would get what I want. Living with him for the past nine years has been a dream. Unfortunately, my dad died about a month ago. He passed away in a tragic car accident while he was coming home from work one night. It was raining and the visibility was limited. Another car coming from the opposite direction lost control and smashed headfirst into my dad's car. He died on the spot without any hope of surviving. So, because I was 17 at the time, I had to move in with my mom. I was a minor, I couldn't live on my own, even though I was perfectly capable of doing so. But the judge said that I needed to stay with an adult. I haven't seen her in such a long time. I did see her two times, but, but briefly. It seemed like she didn't want anything to do with me. And the day came to move in with her. An Uber left me in front of her door. She didn't even bother to pick me up. That's just great. She didn't even come to the door to greet me, I said to myself while I stood in front of her house with my bags by my side. Slowly, I started dragging them up the stairs. Step by step, I felt like they were getting heavier and heavier. The distance from the ground to the door was about 10 steps, but added to that the weight of the luggage and I could barely keep my balance. Finally, I arrive up there. I didn't know what to do. Should I knock or should I go in? She is my mom after all. Maybe I should knock, I kept thinking to myself. I made the decision to just go into the house. As soon as I reached out my hand to turn the doorknob, I heard a sharp scream coming from inside. I immediately opened the door. Mom, are you okay? I asked while looking around for her. Yeah, yeah. Who taught you to come into a house without knocking first? She said. The voice came from a different room, so I abandoned my luggage in the hallway and went over to see her. Hi, Mom, I said as soon as I saw her in her bedroom. But something was off. She was sitting in the middle of the bed, with her back turned towards the door, doing something there. I couldn't see, but I saw her hands moving. Shut up, you'll scare them, she said while doing something with her hands. I asked what she was doing, and at the same time I approached her. As I got right next to her, I could see. She had a big snake in her arms, and in a bowl, there were some white mice. It's dinner time, she said while laughing hysterically. I got scared a little and took a few steps back. She then turned around at me. She asked me if I wanted to see how cute Johnny Boy was. This is the name she gave to her snake. Come closer, look at him, she told me while smiling in a strange way. I felt uncomfortable, but the moment I saw that huge and disgusting snake swallow that little and defenseless mouse whole, I got sick. Excuse me, I said while running out of the room. I went straight to the bathroom and after I searched for it, not knowing where the rooms were, I just threw up everything I ate that day. That's disgusting, my mom said while hearing me doing it. I told her that I couldn't stand the sight of that defenseless little creature being eaten alive. How can you enjoy such things? I asked her while getting my head out of the toilet bowl and heading towards the sink to clean my face. So you'll be living with me, huh? I haven't seen you since you were a kid. You're not as good looking as me, that's for sure. My mom told me before turning around and going to Johnny Boy to feed him the second mouse, I presumed. She didn't show me where my room would be. I just looked around the house and found one that looked like no one sleeps in there. 
It had a small bed for one person, a dresser and a small window, with the glass cracked. It didn't look homey at all, but I thought that with a little bit of patience and a lot of creativity, I could make this room much cozier. Later that evening, for dinner, I had to look in the fridge by myself. As I understood, my mom did not cook. She would just order food. But of course, on the first night I came into her house, she only ordered for herself, saying that she didn't think I was hungry because I looked a little bit too fat. So as I was looking through the fridge, I found a chocolate bar and half a banana. It seemed that would be my dinner for the night, until the next day when I'll go and I'll buy some groceries. I ate those things and I just went to bed. At around 2 a.m., I felt something cold and wet on my chest. It was pretty heavy, too. I thought I was dreaming as I woke up, but my eyes were still closed. I tried to turn on the other side, but I just couldn't. It was something that weighed me down. I opened my eyes and I screamed as hard as my lungs could let me. Take this thing off me! I yelled at my mom while there on my chest, her giant snake was slithering around. She came into my room and she started yelling at me, saying that I'll hurt her snake. Then after she took it off me, she smacked me in the face. I was speechless. I told her, I don't have to stand for this nonsense, and I got up and started to pack. Where do you think you're going? She asked. I'm leaving, I told her. But out of nowhere, she grabbed my arms, putting them at my back. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. She forced me to go in one direction, and we arrived at one door. You're not going anywhere, she yelled before she opened the door and pushed me down the stairs. It was the basement. I hurt my arm pretty bad during the fall. It was pitch dark and it felt like I was standing on mud. It was wet and soft. I got my phone out of my pocket and turned on the flash. My heart missed a beat as I saw that I was standing on maybe 100 snakes, all slithering around down there. I screamed, but all I could hear was my mom laughing. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. She didn't know that I had my phone with me, so I immediately called the police. They arrived in a flash and managed to get me out of there. My mom was soon checked into an institution for people with mental issues. The snakes were taken to different zoos and I eventually got to live with my aunt, my dad's sister, until I went to college. I never heard anything about my mom since that day, and I'm really sorry that it ended up like this. Too scared to subscribe? (laughs) Friends. Who needs them, right? To be honest, I don't have many friends right now. I did when I was a kid, all through middle school and high school. When I got to college, most of us lost touch, and a year after I graduated, well, I was left with only one friend, if I can call him that. His name is Doug, and I've known him for basically all my life. We've been friends for the last 20 years, and we did everything together. Well, we used to anyway. After college, I immediately got a job. I didn't have a great financial situation, and I needed to start from somewhere. I went to several interviews, and surprisingly, they all wanted to hire me. But I chose the place which paid me the most money, even though it was a very slim paycheck. The job was tedious, and besides all the paperwork I had to get done, and all the data that I had to sort, I was also the guy you came to when you needed a cup of coffee, for example. I didn't particularly like it, but I needed to pay my bills. My rent, gas for my car, and my expenses left me with a small sum of money, which I managed to save month after month. You know this friend I mentioned earlier, Doug. Yeah, he's a real piece of work. One day while I was at the office, with my head buried in all kinds of papers, my phone starts ringing. I see that he's calling, but at that exact moment, my boss calls me into his office. I take the phone with me, but I ignore the call. As my boss was talking, my phone rang again. Do you have someone to talk to that's so urgent? He told me. No, sir, I'm sorry, I'll keep it on vibrate, I told him before doing just that. After work, I managed to call Doug back. Hey man, I was busy with, he didn't let me finish. Dude, I need some money like right now. Do you think you could lend me $200? He asked. That may not sound like a lot of money to most of you, but for me, it was a lot. But hey, he was my best friend and I couldn't say no. Sure thing, I'll transfer the money right now, I told him. No, I need cash. I'll come to your office. Just stay there, Doug told me before he hung up the phone. After a few days passed, I got a call again. It was from Doug. I thought he was calling to give me back the money. I didn't expect him to do it so quickly, so I was excited. Hello, I said. Hey, this is really embarrassing. 
Can you lend me $300? I'll pay you back next week. I I promise. I'm just going through a rough patch right now. My boss fired me and I need some money to get by until I get another job. But I have an interview today. I want to look presentable and I was thinking that I'll buy some new clothes, Doug told me. I paused for a second. Another $300? I was trapped for cash as it was, but I guess I should help him out. He told me after all that, he'll be going to an interview. So I agreed and I gave him the money. But this didn't stop there. Oh no, not by a long shot. This continued for another five or six times. I was not someone who could say no to a friend. So I gave him almost all of my savings. The worst part was that my car broke down and I had to get it fixed. It had a problem with an oil leak and I couldn't drive it in that condition. Doug was supposed to give me back all the money almost six months ago. I didn't hear anything from him for a long time, so I decided to call him and ask him to pay me back. It was an embarrassing thing to do from my perspective, but I didn't have any other option. Hey man, I, I really need the money I lent you, or maybe just a part of it. My car broke down, call me back, I told him in a voice message. He didn't pick up the phone. After about two hours, I got a text from Doug. He didn't even have the decency to call me back. He sent me a screenshot of his bank balance. It was about $120. So, he told me he couldn't pay me back without actually saying it. It got desperate. I didn't know what to do to fix my car, but after I calmed down, I reached the conclusion that taking the bus for a month until I get my next paycheck won't be that bad. One evening while I was on the couch, I hear aggressive knocking at the door. I get up to see who it is, but I couldn't see anyone through the peephole. I opened the door and before I knew it, someone punched me right in the face, causing me to fall to the floor. Where's my money? The guy told me while picking me up by my collar and punching me again. I didn't know what was going on and I told him to stop. Who are you? You got the wrong guy, I yelled. Oh yeah? You'll give me my money now, the guy told me. I repeated myself that he had the wrong guy. You're Doug's friend, right? Yeah? I found out that Doug owed some dangerous people a lot of money. Also, the guy told me that Doug was a real party animal, spending everything he had on drugs, gambling, alcohol, and women. Doug owes us a lot of money, and when we threatened him, he told us to come to you. You'll pay his debt for him. I froze. I didn't know how to react. I got up and I told the guy that Doug owed me a lot of money also, and that I couldn't possibly pay him back. Well, I didn't come here for nothing, he told me. After saying that, he walked towards my TV. Hey, stop it! I said while putting my hand on his shoulder. The guy turned around and punched me in the face. He then took my TV and left. There I was, sitting on the floor with a bloody nose and lip, a black eye, without any money and without my TV. Eventually, I managed to get by. I ate only potatoes and bread for the next month. I fixed my car and after another month, I managed to buy a new TV. I never talked to Doug until six months later. I got a notification that the money I lent him were transferred into my account, but the owner of the person who sent it was a woman. Through mutual friends, I found out that Doug got a new girlfriend. She was loaded, but she treated him poorly, like a slave. And the only reason why he stuck around was for the money. Looking for a new apartment is a lottery. You never know what kind of neighbors you'll get. You'll never know what kind of flaws the new flat will have. And you definitely don't know what type of person the owner of the place is. And this is why I'm going to tell you my story. A story about a house owner which, let's put it in simple terms, was not what I was expecting. I finally found myself a place which fit my then budget and was exactly what I needed at the time. On a Friday afternoon, I went to the place to meet the owner. As I walked into the building, I, I saw a man sitting at the door. Welcome. He said, Hello, I'm, I said, but even before I could finish saying my name, he shook my hand with both of his. Hello, James, I've been expecting you. I have a great feeling about you. To be honest, I have some experiences with other people which didn't pay the rent on time, but as far as I can see, we're going to get along great, the owner told me, still smiling. We had a small conversation in the hallway before we went inside so he could show me around. The place was even better than I expected. He was very patient, taking the time to answer all my questions. Well, the, the place looks great. I, I, I think I love it here. It's even close to the bus station. I hate driving my car sometimes when the traffic is just terrible, I told him. Yes, it's in walking distance to anything you'll ever need, James, he responded. 
As I walked around, I found a door. I tried to open it, but as soon as I pulled on the doorknob, the owner got right between me and the door. What's in there, and why is it locked? I asked him. <laughs> he laughed before continuing with the explanation. This was my own personal storage place. The room is small anyway, so you don't need it. You have plenty of space to store your belongings, he told me. And I completely understood. The apartment was spacious, and I thought he was right. I'm sure I'll like it. If it's okay, I need to shift immediately, like by tonight, and I'll send over the money on Monday. How does that sound? I asked him. He was a pretty generous guy, and he agreed. And then we both parted ways. That first night in my new apartment, it was a torture. It was really hot outside. I barely got any sleep. And a strange smell invaded my nostrils as I was tossing and turning, trying to get some shut-eye. Finally, at around 8 a.m., I got up from bed. I went into the bathroom to brush my teeth, but as soon as I started my morning routine, I had a strong urge to vomit. I even dropped my toothbrush. I got out of the bathroom and tried to find the source of the smell. It was simply horrible. I soon found the place. It was the owner's storage room. I believe that since it was really hot that night, whatever he kept in there must have been rotting or something. I tried to call him, but his phone was off. I just couldn't get a hold of him. So I went online and tried to find a locksmith on a Sunday. It was a long shot, but I couldn't stand that smell. Finally, I found someone. I gave him a call, and after I told him the address, he paused for a moment. Hello? Are you still there? I asked him, noticing that he didn't say anything. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll be right there in about 10 minutes, he told me before hanging up the phone. I thought it was pretty strange the way he reacted, but I really needed somebody. Later on, the man arrived. He came to the door and I opened it. Hello, this room is... And I didn't even finish to tell him where the room was. And he went straight to it. It was like he'd been there before. The locksmith managed to open the locked door pretty quickly and as soon as he did... We were both hit with a smell that nearly knocked us off our feet. But the thing we saw after that was, it was mortifying. The smell came from a corpse, a girl's corpse which was rotten. Flies and maggots were all over the body. I quickly called the police after my hands stopped shaking. They arrived in no time. After the police investigated, they figured out that the body was of a previous tenant. They had complaints about her. The owner called the police when she was living there, saying that she didn't pay the rent and she refused to leave. But she would deny it, even having proof that she paid. It seemed that the owner killed her, believing that she didn't actually pay him. It was his word against hers. That day, I packed my bag and I got the heck out of there. I didn't want anything to do with this cursed place. Fast forward five years, I lived in a new place, obviously. It was far away from that cursed apartment. I slowly got on with my life and the images of that corpse finally faded from my mind. One night as I was slowly falling asleep, I felt something around my neck. You forgot to pay your rent. A rope which was getting tighter and tighter started to cut off the blood circulation in my brain. What? Uh, who are you? I asked the man who was trying to kill me. You forgot to pay the rent. He said the same thing, only this time he shouted in my ear. As the seconds went by, I felt my vision went blurry. I couldn't even hear anything. Before I passed out in that state that I was in, I realized that it was the cursed apartment owner. He must have gotten out of jail. Please, I begged him to let me go, but it, it looked like I was going to die right there and then. Seconds before I passed out, I heard another voice. Let him go. And then a loud <gasps> sound. It sounded like a, a baseball bat. I fell to the ground and as I turned around, I saw another familiar face. It was the locksmith from the day we discovered the dead girl. I knew he was going to try to kill you. I've watched you for the past two weeks ever since he got out of jail, the locksmith told me. What are you, what are you talking about? How, how did you know? I asked him while I started to feel better. You know when I opened the door and I saw that dead girl, well, I did the same for her. She called me for the same reason and smell and we found another dead body. I saw a pattern and I knew that he'd come for you, the locksmith explained. I thanked him and we called the police. The man was taken away to jail for life and fortunately for me, he won't be back anytime soon to try and kill me. But I still suffer from regular nightmares since that night. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> My name is Peter and I am 27 years old. 
By this age, you might think that I would have my life together, that I would have a steady, normal 9 to 5 job, that I would have my own place, and that I would think about having a family of my own. Yeah, that may be the traditional route that so many guys take, but not me. See, since I was just a small kid, I got compliments on my looks. To keep it short, I always look good. I have blue eyes, dirty blonde hair, and a defined jawline. From the age of 15, I started going to the gym, and the fact that I perfected my body to near model level made me that much more desirable to women. Because I am attractive, I got special attention in almost any situation. Life was easy for me, and I never had to struggle to get anything, most of the time. I couldn't see myself at a desk, wasting my life away. I like to live it up and party. What I'm about to tell you about, well, my profession, may seem like unethical to some of you, but I just want to tell you the truth. The truth is that I am, I was actually, a person who kept women company, for lack of a better word, for the position. But not just any type of women. I would seduce older women who had a very good financial situation. I mean mansions, luxury cars, maids, different properties, and so on. I didn't care how they got in that position. I could have been through an inheritance, hard work, or just the fact that they married rich. And I was their toy. I was taken care of. I had the luxury of going to any country in the world on their private jets. I was spoiled with champagne, designer clothes, expensive watches, and the list goes on. Basically, I didn't have to work. All I had to do was keep them company, accompany them to different events, and, among other things, you can figure out for yourself. They would take care of me, and I would whisk the loneliness away. It was a win-win. I was living the dream, and everything was perfect for a while. This went on for a couple of years, and by meeting and working for these different women, I was introduced to more of them. I was a part of a different social class in no time. I forgot how to ride the bus, and I learned the difference between a Ferrari Monza and a Ferrari F40. Yeah, everything was amazing. One evening, while I was accompanying one of my dates to this social gala, I heard about this heiress of some massive fortune. She came out of old money, her ancestors doing all kinds of businesses, and she was well connected with people who mattered. I saw her, and I might say, she was stunning. Even though she was almost 20 years older than me, I introduced myself, and that's the evening my life started to change. We started talking more and more, and obviously, she knew what I did for a living. Because she was so rich, she told me to give up on the other women and be her own personal boy toy. I couldn't say no to her, so that's just what I did. I renounced all my former employers. Since I became exclusive with her, I started living in a new level of luxury. I won't say what that felt like because words can't describe it. What I do want to say is that after about two months, I found out what she did, apart from owning a lot of different hotels and businesses. One of her most shady businesses revolved around collecting money from people who borrowed different sums from shady people, like mobsters, drug dealers, loan sharks, and so on. She didn't do it herself, of course. She had her own crew of dangerous individuals, and I think some of them were assassins who were on her payroll. Yeah, that chick was really dangerous, but I didn't realize it at the time. One day, while I was chilling at the pool, drinking a fancy cocktail, she came over to me. Get up, Peter. What's up, babe? Is everything okay? I asked her, wondering why she was so angry. You have started to get lazy, Peter. I gave you this life, and what do you do? Have fun all day while I work? This wasn't the deal. She told me while moving a step closer. Come on, relax. What are you on about? I replied. It's time for you to pay your dues. I want you to do something for me, she said. What, do you want another massage? I asked while smiling. I want you to kill someone, she said without showing any emotion. In that moment, I dropped my drink. 
I could not believe what she was saying. Are you for real? I asked her. Yeah. You know I'm not going to do that, babe. I told her. And at that moment, she snapped her fingers and two massive henchmen of hers came to me and one of them took out a big knife. She took the knife from him and sat down on my chair. Then, slowly, while looking into my eyes, she put the knife on my willy. Are you sure you won't do it, Peter? She asked me without breaking eye contact. At that moment, my heart was racing. I didn't know how to react, so to save myself, I agreed to kill that person. She then smiled and gave me a peck, saying that she'll give me the details later. After about two hours, she told me who I had to kill and where that person lived. But why do you want him dead? I asked her while my voice was shaking. That's none of your business. Just do it. It's for your own good. That's the only response I got from her. Later in the night, a car dropped me off at the house. The henchman gave me a gun and just left me there. I tried to sneak into the house, walking slowly close to the wall. I eventually got in through the back door. As I was planning to go upstairs, all of a sudden the alarm went off. Red lights impaired my vision and due to the noise of the alarm, I couldn't hear my mark coming down the stairs. Got you! I heard before the sound of a gunshot pierced my ears. All of a sudden, I felt something in my arm. The bullet went through it. I panicked, dropped my gun, and ran away. The man shot a few more times in my direction, but he didn't hit me. I knew that I'll die anyway because I failed to kill my mark. So, with the little money I saved up, I bought myself a plane ticket and flew to another city that very night. Since that day, I have been living off the grid, constantly in fear that she will find and kill me without hesitation. I don't want to tell you guys my name because my story, well, it's very disturbing. I did an unforgettable thing and I'll have to live with the guilt as long as I live. I don't sleep much, but when I do manage to close my eyes and drift away, I wake up minutes later, covered in cold sweat, shivering and seeing her in front of my eyes. You may be wondering, who am I referring to when I say her? Well, let me just start from the beginning. At the time when all this happened, and when my life changed for the worst, I was working at a burger place. It was really popular amongst the locals. We made the best burgers in town. The entire staff was nice, and I had a really great time working there. Well. Almost everyone was nice. My manager, a woman called Mandy, acted like she owned the place. She was rude with everyone, especially me. I know that managers must have a position of authority over their subordinates, but what she used to do was downright harassment. Move, stupid. Gosh, you're useless. I don't know why you ever got hired to work here. She would tell me on a daily basis. Most of the time, I wouldn't even look at her. It was something out of a movie. Like those scenes you see when the bully says something to a nerdy kid and he just looks down at his feet. The only difference was that we were both adults and I had to stand up for myself. I tried once, but it didn't go well at all. You know, Mandy, I don't appreciate you calling me names all the time, I told her. Oh, really? You don't think you deserve to be called stupid? Okay, then. I get it. I'll call you an idiot from now on. How about that? She asked while raising her voice and taking a step towards me. I didn't reply. I asked, how about that, idiot? She repeated the question. Okay, I said while I turned around to do my work. I felt like the scum of the earth. I felt like nothing. One day, as I was serving a customer, I realized that I had mistakenly gave him a small soda instead of a medium. The guy said it was okay. It's better this way. I should hold off on the sugar as I'm trying to lose some pounds, he told me while we both had a laugh. Mandy heard the conversation and started shouting from across the room. I'm sorry, sir. He's simply a good-for-nothing idiot. Let me make it up to you and give you a complimentary cookie, she said. The guy responded saying that it was okay and he'll take the small soda. But she insisted and didn't let him leave without the cookie, even though he said that he wanted to cut back on the sugar. 
Then she turned around at me and threatened me with termination. She also said that I was a worthless piece of crap and that she was this close to punching me in the face. The entire scene took place in front of the customers and my colleagues, but she didn't have any remorse about it. I felt bad. I felt like I wanted to crawl somewhere and hide from the rest of the world. My life was miserable, and with each day of being called names, I felt even more down, to the point that I almost got depressed. But that wasn't the moment in which I snapped. Oh no, that moment came about five days later. We had a team meeting, like we always do once a month. We would talk about how to improve sales, customer satisfaction, and all these types of things. As usual, I would be quiet, fearing that I might do something to anger Mandy, and as she was talking endlessly, I zoned out. And then all of a sudden, a loud noise snapped me out of my state. Hello, are you here, idiot? She told me after hitting the table right in front of me. Y yes Mandy, I'm sorry, I, j I, I tried to justify my lack of attention. Come on, come to the front. She told me before I quickly did what she said. Mandy started giving me as an example, a negative one. I stood there while she pointed out how I was the single most stupid employee she ever had and how I was completely useless. She kept going on and on with the insults. Stop, that's enough, I told her while the entire team gasped. Stop, she repeated before bursting into laughter. You don't tell me to stop, she said before slapping me across the face in front of everyone. One side of my face turned red and I was just about to tear up. Everyone froze. They didn't know how to react. Go home, idiot, and come back tomorrow with a better attitude. You're no use to me at this meeting anyway, she told me. I turned around and I sprinted out of the office, running to the bus station. I never felt more embarrassed in my entire life. I had enough. I couldn't take it anymore. That night, I logged into my computer. I needed to clear my head. I was a frequent visitor of the dark web, and that's exactly where I went. That day, I saw a service that caught my eye. Professional assassin available, it said. I clicked on it and I saw all the details about the job. As I was still mad, I clicked around, wondering how it would be to go to work and not find Mandy there. I got to check out the page and I saw that I would get an 80% discount as it was my first time ordering. I ordered the hit on Mandy, filled in all the details and shut off my computer. I went to bed dreading the next day because I just couldn't take the abuse anymore. But for the next three to four days, Mandy was, well, different. She started to keep to herself. She wasn't calling me an idiot anymore. I don't know what happened. Finally, on a Friday, she called us all into her office. I reluctantly went in. We didn't speak for an entire week, so I didn't know what was going on. She didn't speak to anyone, actually. Guys, I have something to say to you. I know I've been a real pain to everyone, and I want to sincerely apologize from the bottom of my heart. That incident with the slap really opened my eyes, and I saw what I've become for some time now. She told us while we were all in shock. It was the first time she was nice to us, and we didn't know what was going on. She continued to tell us that she had a boyfriend, which made her life miserable. He would make her feel small, abused her, both verbally and physically. She was powerless. The only time in the day when she felt confident and powerful was at work. And that's why she lashed out on us, especially on me, because I resembled to her her ex. She had this view on men, this view in which every guy is abusive and controlling, and she needed to get back at them. And then she personally came to each one of us and apologized for everything she did. And when she came to me, she gave me a hug and started crying. I hugged her back. I'm so sorry. You didn't deserve this and I'm such a horrible person, she told me. It's okay, Mandy, I told her and I hugged her even tighter. It was a beautiful moment and for the first time, I saw her as a human being, not as a monster. To our surprise, she decided to resign and move to another city so she can get away from her old life. We all understood that and wished her all the best. But one thing popped into my mind, the assassination. Was it real? I felt bad for even clicking on it, but I thought it would just be a hoax. I mean, it was so cheap. Who would ever kill someone for that small amount of money? After work, we all got out of the burger shop and stood for a couple more minutes in the parking lot talking. Everyone seemed happy, and Mandy was laughing and talking to us like we were friends. So guys, I just... We heard a gunshot, and Mandy collapsed to the ground. 
We all screamed and looked around. We ducked to the ground, covering our heads, but nothing happened. I got up and went over to Mandy. She was bleeding profusely. The bullet went straight into her chest. She was coughing blood and I held her hand, telling her that it will be all right. Her eyes teared up and so did mine. I knew it was my fault. I knew I was the reason she was going to die. The ambulance came, but it was too late. Mandy died and so did my soul. The next day I couldn't come to work and I soon resigned. Now I'm forced to live out my days with this guilt. I got a person killed without even really knowing her. I can't sleep, I can't think, and I can't even do anything. I'll run out of money soon and I don't know what to do. All I know is that I'm a murderer. I've never been one to socialize with people. I've always been a nerd and like computers from an early age. And instead of going out with friends, I would watch YouTube all day long. I had a few favorite creators. They were mostly prank channels. I would laugh all day long while eating ice cream at my desk and would even forget to go down for dinner sometimes. I was that immense in those prank channels. I had thought that maybe I could make one for myself. There was one channel that I started following when it only had 200 subscribers and it grew rapidly, blowing up almost overnight. Why couldn't I do this, I said to myself. It's not that hard, I mean. Those pranks really hit the spot, but they are simple. Also, this could help me with my anxiety around people. Maybe I'll become more confident. It's a win-win situation. I continued to build myself up and it was a really great idea, but I had some planning to do first. I started to research what type of pranks do people like because I didn't want to start on the wrong foot. I wanted a rapid growth like the other channel. I saw that the most popular pranks at the time were the ones where someone would dress up as a bush and scare people as they walk by. I thought that was pretty easy enough. I stayed up all night to make my costume and by the morning, it was perfect. I went out on the street and I filmed the entire day. People would scream, but after they saw that it was a prank, they would all laugh and I would point to the camera showing them where it was. You're crazy. I thought I was pretty brave, but it seems like even a bush can scare me, one guy said before we both had a laugh. I had a lot of fun, and as the day passed, I started to become more and more confident, and I actually liked talking to people. It was like I discovered a side to myself that I didn't know I had. I was happy being outside. It was something new to me. Things were going great, and before I knew it, I already had 200 subscribers. I made a special video thanking everyone who supported me, even though it wasn't an impressive number. But all I thought about was that I managed to be at the exact same spot where the channel that blew up was. I already saw myself being successful and reaching over 100,000 subscribers, if not more. My channel was growing at a really fast rate and I wasn't going to stop. Things went amazing for a while and I started to get recognized in my hometown. There were even some people who followed my channel very closely and would come up to me so we could take a picture. I would feel like a celebrity every time. You're that guy, right? From YouTube. I love those pranks. Me and my friends watch you all the time, they would tell me, and my heart would fill with joy. One day as I was doing my usual prank, this time climbing up a tree and throwing a mannequin down in front of people as if it were a guy who fell from the tree, the prank caught on well, but one guy got really mad. I could not believe what was going on. No one had gotten mad before. They would normally get a little startled, but they would laugh about it in the end. But no, not this guy. After I did the prank and saw that it wasn't a real person, he flipped out. You idiot. I should throw you from the tree, or I should break your neck right here on the sidewalk. How about that? He said to me. Then he took the mannequin and he threw it at me, calling me names and threatening to kill me. I'll kill you. Get over here he said while taking a few steps forward. Come on, man, it's, it's just a prank, relax. I also said that I have it all on camera, so I advised him not to be violent. As I came down, he punched me in the face before kicking me in the ribs. I was lucky that two men passed by and stopped him. Hey, stop it, why don't you pick on someone your own size? The men told him and he ran away. Thank you, I didn't know what that guy's problem was. It was just a prank, I told the guys. Be careful here, kid. There's a lot of weirdos, they told me before walking away. I got up and went to my car to go home, but first I wanted to get something to eat. I kept thinking that even though I got beat up, this could be the video to make me blow up after blurring the guy's face. 
I went to my favorite sandwich shop and I grabbed a couple. They were small, but really good. The sun set and it started to get dark. I was driving home when I saw that a car was behind me. So I did some turns to make sure he wasn't following me, but a car was close up behind mine. I freaked out, thinking that it might be that guy. I didn't see its number plate because it was so dark, so I stepped on the gas. Not before long, I lost the car. I felt relieved and drove to my house. I left the car in the driveway and just went inside. After a quick shower, I sat down to edit the videos on my computer. As I was slicing and adding music, the screen went blank and the entire house actually went dark. It was a power outage. I got up from my chair to see if the fuse box was in order. It was in the basement, so I took my phone and I used the flashlight. As I went down the stairs, someone pushed me from behind and I started to fall forward, stopping when I hit the bottom of the stairs. I felt dizzy and before I could get up, I was lifted up by my collar by someone and thrown around the basement. I pointed my flashlight toward him and there he was, that weird guy from the prank video. He started punching me in the face repeatedly and I wasn't able to defend myself. I told you I'd kill you, didn't I? You're dead, he said to me while hitting me in the eyes. He beat me up bad. I couldn't see with one eye and the other one started to swell up. I found an old piece of wood with a nail in it and as he came to kick me while I was down, he stuck it in his leg. You little jerk, he yelled and fell to the floor in agony. That was my chance to get up, so I did it and I ran to the stairs. The man got up quickly and managed to grab my leg as I was halfway up the stairs. You're dead. You don't get out of here alive, he shouted. I managed to kick him in the face with my free leg and he fell down the stairs. Then there was silence. I couldn't hear anything. I pointed my flashlight toward him and there he was. His eyes wide open and he was groaning. I went to him and I saw that he couldn't move. He must have hit something in his spine and gotten paralyzed. I called the cops and they quickly came to my place and they got him out of the basement on a stretcher. The guy wasn't dead, but he couldn't move. You're lucky to get out of this thing alive. I would cool it with the pranks for a while. My colleague will be talking to you at the hospital. Post recovery, we expect you to report to the station. You got yourself into a mess, mister. I am here hiding from the cops. They know what I've done, but they don't know who I am, and neither will you. I am a private guy, but I'll tell you some general facts about me so that you'll get everything I'm going to lay out. As I said, I'm a quiet guy. I've never been the type to, I don't know, stand out or talk to people out of the blue. I barely talk when other people approach me. I work in a gaming company as a techie. Yeah, I'm kind of a nerd. Because I never really developed social skills when I was growing up, I turned to computers, programming, and so on. I liked tech stuff. I liked to create programs and games. I even made my first game, be it a simple one, when I was just 12 years old. I see that as a huge accomplishment. But let's get back to the current day. Although I work in a huge gaming company, I sit all day in a small room, far away from the main office and the other employees, and I take care of the system, more or less. No one knows my name. Some of them call me the IT guy, and that's just about it. But something happened two days ago. That's why I'm hiding. Ever since I worked here, I had a crush on my boss. I know it sounds weird, but believe me, if you'd see her, you'd have a crush too. Well, you can't anymore, but I'll tell you about that later. I think I like powerful women. Women who are in charge or something. All I know is that I wanted her so bad. I've only talked to her once. I mostly talked. She was busy with some paperwork. I was called up in her office to fix the router. Hey, IT guy. Come to my office right now. My router is acting up. I heard on the little speaker I have in my office. Coming right up. Do you need... And before I could finish my question, the call ended. I knew that this was my chance. I couldn't see her any other time. So I grabbed a small camera and a microphone and put them in my pocket. As soon as I entered her office, I started sweating. Hello, you said you needed me to take a look at the router? I asked. But without even looking at me, she nodded. 
I didn't want to bother her, so I started working. As I did that, I also installed the camera and mic. I wanted to see her all day, and this was the only way, at that time at least. Two days ago, I heard an interesting phone call. She would mostly talk about work stuff, but this time it was personal. I heard her talking on the phone with a friend of hers. They planned to meet up after work. I even heard the address. So naturally, right after she left her office, I did too. I got into my car and followed her, but I stayed back so I wouldn't raise suspicion. I arrived at the building but didn't get out of my car. I watched her from behind my tinted windows. She met up with her friend and they both went in. I wonder if she thinks about me sometimes. I mean, I was at my best when I went into her office. That must have clearly left an impression, I said to myself while sipping on a can of soda. After about two hours, she came out and hopped into her car. She started driving and I went after her again, keeping my distance. She then went into a store to buy some clothes, but this time I didn't stay in the car. I got out and followed her in. I wanted to see her up close. I couldn't resist it anymore. But I didn't want her being startled, so I thought about being stealthy. I hid behind the clothes so she wouldn't notice me. Since there were a lot of people in the store, I lost track of her for a brief moment. And right after that, as I was looking around, I bumped into someone. It was her. Couldn't believe it. I actually touched her. Excuse me, I said while looking in her eyes. That's okay, I guess, she said. Do I know you from somewhere? She then asked. At that moment, my world fell apart. There I was, thinking that I left a good impression, only to come to the conclusion that she doesn't even know who I am. No, I quickly replied and turned around, walking towards the exit. I was so embarrassed. I should have gone home in that exact moment, but something didn't let me. I had to be close to her. Then I followed her home. I had managed to get her address from the office records earlier and reached her place before she did. I could see her in the living room while she was getting undressed. I couldn't believe how great she looked. She had a body of a goddess. After about two hours, I guess she went to bed. I am not a bad guy, but something told me to go in, so I followed my instincts. I managed to open the back door and there I was, inside her house. I started looking at photos she had placed all over the place. While I was doing that, I knocked down a lamp which broke on impact. The noise was enough to wake her up. Who is there? I have a gun, she said while rushing down the stairs. I didn't try to hide or run away as I was confident she would understand my feelings for her. She immediately saw me and pointed the gun towards me. Get out of here! Didn't I see you at the store earlier? Have you been following me? Are you some kind of stalker? She said. I didn't appreciate all those accusations. I work with you, I said. Stay right there, I'll call the police. As I was standing there with my hands up, I saw another photo. It was her and a man. Who's that? I asked her. My boyfriend. Hello, 911? Yes, I have an intruder. She continued like it wasn't a big deal, like it wasn't something important, the fact that she was in a photo with a guy. When I heard the word boyfriend, I couldn't concentrate on anything else. I saw red in front of my eyes. How could she be so selfish? She had to be mine. So I attacked her in a fit of rage. She shot the gun, but missed me. I managed to grab it, and in the struggle, a bullet went into her stomach. She fell to the ground, bleeding. Her white robe turned red. I had blood on my hands. I'm sorry, are you okay? I asked her, but she didn't respond. Blood started coming out of her mouth. She was coughing. Shortly after, I heard police sirens. Immediately, 
I managed to get out of the house, but I didn't leave. I stayed for a bit longer, looking through the glass so I could see what happened. Only after they investigated and declared her dead, I ran away. Now, I am at a secret location hiding. I don't want to get in trouble. I think I'll just wait here until everything clears up. I stared at my best friend as she narrated how she got an A1 grade in our last assignment. She was the only one who did. Everyone else complained of how difficult the programming assignment was. Bella told me that she had a guy on the dark web to do her assignment for her. It's amazing how much information is available there that we don't know about, she said. I had heard stories about the dark web before. People claimed it was the site for criminals and dangerous people to have free access to do whatever they wanted to do without supervision. People said that activities that went on on the dark web were impossible to trace. And now, my best friend was telling me she just used it to ace her assignment. That meant it could not be all that bad. We were both sophomores studying programming. Recently, our lectures had started tasking us with assignments that were more difficult than we imagined. They claimed it was to make us better programmers. If we could solve some of the toughest problems in programming, then we would be really good at it. I shook my head in amazement at what Bella said and just laughed over it. When I got to my room, though, I couldn't help but think about it. I fired up my laptop and logged into the dark web with butterflies in my tummy. It looked like a normal site to me. I typed in advanced programming in the search box and a lot of details and sites popped up. I clicked the one that claimed could solve anything within moments. It directed me to a chat box. I sent in the question that only Bella aced and waited nervously. If this was true, then I was on my way to a five-point grade. After two minutes, an answer was provided. My jaw dropped as I went through it. It was flawless. I laughed in glee. All those rumors about the dark web were false. Since then, I have used it to answer all my assignments. Bella and I were regarded as geniuses in class. We made sure to go over what we turned in so there would be no suspicion. It made me better as a programmer and I marveled at the fact that someone could be that good and was wasting his talent on the dark web. It was nothing short of amazing. I spent less time worrying over an assignment or term paper. Bella and I had more free time. The dark web was our secret and we intended to keep it that way. I started to get notifications from the dark web. The person on the other end of the chat box messaged me first. I frowned as I opened the message. Do you enjoy this? I smiled as I typed in yes. Only an idiot would not enjoy it. Don't you think I should get a reward? I nodded in the affirmative and asked what kind of reward. University professors were impressed with how my grades had skyrocketed. It was only fair that the person helping me got a reward. Send me your nudes, babe. I froze and rubbed my eyes, sure that I wasn't seeing correctly. The message was still there. I swallowed, suddenly scared. I could be a guy, but it seemed like the person knew I was a girl. There was no way I would send my naked pictures to someone I didn't even know. I shut down my laptop and promised myself that that was the end of the dark web for me. I had better start reading so I could back up all the high scores I was getting. The next day, I noticed that Bella was being moody. When I asked her about it, she told me she was just tired and it was nothing for me to worry about. I didn't believe her, but she would not give me any other explanation, so I left her alone. I wanted to tell her about the message I got from the dark web, but decided against it. I was done with it. There was no need to bring it up. Bella didn't seem in the mood for a discussion anyway. I got to my room and lay down on my bed. As I switched on the laptop, all my notifications were about the dark web. This was really driving me crazy. There were messages from the programmer guy. He kept asking me to send my nudes. I shut off the site completely and logged out. 
There was no way for him to reach me, I thought to myself, smiling. I went to have my dinner. By the time I was done, I saw that my phone had been pinged with different messages. I frowned, thinking it was spam. I opened it and dropped my phone in shock. You have no choice. Send me your nudes. How did he get my number? I was scared and didn't know what to do. Should I call the police? He had not done anything wrong, so I had nothing to report. My phone pinged again. I'm asking you for the last time. Don't make me angry. I summoned up courage and blocked his number. There was nothing he could do, I told myself. It was just an empty threat. When my phone rang, I almost jumped out of my skin. It was Bella. I picked it up, relieved. She was crying. Vivian, this dark web thing is driving me crazy. She told me that she had been blackmailed by the person helping her. She had been sending her pictures regularly to the person, but now he wanted more. The guy on the dark web wanted her in person now. I told Bella how I had blocked him and she too should do the same. Oh, Vivian, you should not have blocked him. Hope you haven't reached out to the cops. Bella said and disconnected the call. I could not believe her. How could she be so timid, I thought. Around an hour later, I got another notification on my phone. It was a video. I saw Bella tied onto her bed with two pipes plugged in her chest. My heart skipped a beat as I watched the pipes drain all the blood out of her body. Within minutes, Bella was lifeless. Her body had lost its color and she did not move. I went to bed. It was 3 a.m. and I could not sleep. I wanted to tell the cops, but Bella's last words kept playing in my head. My brain was too numb to think of anything. Perhaps by then, I had resigned to my fate. My body was sweating profusely. I went into the bathroom to take my usual night shower. I screamed as blood came out of the shower head, like real blood. I draped my towel and ran to the bedroom. I called up Vivian, but her number was not reachable. I sat there, cold, covered in someone else's blood. My whole body was shivering. My brain went numb, unable to think of anything. Somehow, I gathered courage and picked up my phone. My heart was pounding so fast, I could feel my heartbeat without touching my chest. I dialed 911 and informed them of what had happened. They told me to stay calm and help would be sent soon. The word soon didn't sound so comforting. As I waited for the cops to arrive, I received a call from an unknown number. So, how does Bella smell? Now it's your turn, bitch. <laughs> that evil laugh was too much for me. I fainted. As I opened my eyes, I found myself in a hospital bed. The police told me that my friend Bella had been found dead in her house. The killer was yet to be traced. They told me to call them up if I sense something suspicious. It has been 10 days since this incident. I haven't stepped out of my house since then, nor have I taken a shower. Every night, I kept thinking about Bella and her lifeless body. I am sure I would meet the same fate as her, not by choice, but force.